Hello, I'm Tim Sutton, your moderator today, and welcome to the first ever Encito Live Ask Nitin session, which we hope will become a weekly highlight event for everyone watching. Uh, we're very glad that you've taken a few minutes out of your day to spend it with us. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome best-selling author, winning, author of Winning in the Digital Age, entrepreneur, management consultant, and CEO of Encito, Nitin Sat. Welcome, Nitin. Thanks, Tim. You know, that seems almost, sounds almost like a matrimonial Edward, but I will let that pass. Happy married okay. for 25 years, but very happy to be um, having this conversation with you and very happy to be sharing um, thoughts um, with the audience here. We are living in very, very interesting times the last um, 18 months of COVID. Um, and I look forward to sharing um, my learning, my reflections with the, all of you. And we've received a lot of questions. I think people are really excited to, to hear your thoughts on many subject matters. So uh, with that, I want to sort of quickly cover what we're going to cover so people know. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about what a post-COVID-19 world will look like. And, and as part of that, we're gonna talk about how to navigate the ever-changing VUCA world, V-U-C-A. Um, we'll talk about the new rules of business that you introduced in the Winning in the Digital Age. And we'll also talk about uh, creating a cycle of positivity in, in the VUCA world. So um, one quick you know, housekeeping note to everyone in the audience. Um, the first set of questions that we're going to cover come from um, what we've taken from the many learning sessions that Nitin has done with fan, book fans, um, present presentations to universities with employees, and also presentations from the media events. So um, the larger uh, encouragement to the audience is please, 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 um, we encourage you to insert your questions into the comment section of LinkedIn Live. And we'll do our best to, to cover as many of them as we can. So um, with that, Nitin, we'll get started here. Uh, question one, you know, um, before we talk about the future, many want to know about the past and specifically the global pandemic changed everything seemingly overnight last year. What was your experience as a seasoned man, uh, leader facing an entirely new challenge and um, how did you manage the uncertainty and what did you personally learn from it all? Thanks, Tim. And um, yeah, global pandemic is, uh, you know, first I just want to say is you know, we're still very much in the middle of it. It's not, not done. It's not just a 2020 phenomena that happened. It's still happening. And in different parts of the world are, are you know, impacted at different levels. I think here in the United States, you know, perhaps you know, we feel, okay, you know, the worst is past us and you know, we can look forward to a nice summer of you know, uh, no mask or fewer mask and life getting back to normal. But in India, you know, we're just going through a absolutely devastating um, second wave, you know, which just um, sprung up on us. So uh, it's still, um, Still very much going through that, and I and I do want to just mention and acknowledge that um, you know what a what a great grave human tragedy um, world has gone through, and I think all of us have personally at some level gone through that, and you know, we're still going through that. Uh, you know, but show has to go on, right? That's what life is about. Um, so so last year, see, it was. It, this is completely unprecedented, and, and this COVID as it hit, as it really started unfolding in February and March last year, I think it took everybody by surprise, Absolutely. and nobody knew really how it was going to unfold. Um, and you know, the great privilege of serving a number of Fortune 100 clients, and you know talking to them and the reactions varied from, hey, this is just like two, three months and we'll be fine to absolute doomsday. Yeah, right. so uh, I don't think there was a consistent view. Um, for me, and I think for many of the, the leaders that 
I know the absolute key was very quick action. Yeah, very quick action. Um, in, you know, for, for, for our business and CEDO, in literally a week or perhaps two weeks at, mo at most, you know, we had to move to an operating model, which was 100% uh, remote. Yeah, wow. and and you know, a lot of uh, you know all the work historically was happening in the offices. Um, you know, it was ninety nine percent of our output was delivered through our offices. A lot of those were secure spaces, ODCs and offshore development centers, as we call them. And and so we had to just change very very quickly. And you know, we moved very fast. Our employees moved very fast, and our clients moved very fast. In many cases they had to take a lot of regulatory approvals. So, um, and, and we made the shift and I think industry made that shift. Um, and it was a very dramatic shift. And if you were to think about that, even you know, pre-COVID, if you were to ask, okay, can you do 100% of your work remotely? The answer would have been, no, absolutely not. That's just not possible. But that happened and that has been happening now for, you know, 16, 17 months. So it's quite, quite incredible. So adaptability, I think is just, you know, I would say is just simply the most important, uh, I think what we did, and I think is also the important learning. I think the second thing that uh, uh, came through was resilience. Because you know, as we went into COVID, it was always, you know, it was okay, how far is this thing going to go? And it just seemed to keep on going, extending, extending, extending. Now, you know, initially, you know, you are okay. So, oh, this is a change. You know, I'm I'm gonna do it. And then it just, you know, you are in your house. You know, you're not traveling. You know, you are, you know, and it just keeps going on and on. And the and the resilience just to just to keep going. Um, I think is a second learning, and I think a very important. Uh, aspects of the pandemic. And the third is around engagement. You know, how do you engage? See, we as human beings, we are social animals. You know, we feed off each other's energy. And you know, you're not meeting colleagues, you're not meeting clients. How do you, how do you, how do you really influence? You know, how do you get inspired yourself? And and to do that remotely uh, over Zoom or WebEx or whatever. Uh, I, I think it was a completely different art um, that you have to infuse uh, and and get energy virtually, which I think is a very very uh, very different process. Uh, and, the, and the final point I want to make, and, and then I'll stop, um, is, is just about um, as as COVID progressed, I think especially the second wave that happened in India, and that has happened in some other parts of the world as well, I think also brought very, very closely this thing about human values. What is really important? What is really important that uh, you know, we are all chasing goals and you know, we are all chasing, you know, uh, you know, trying to create value and, and all of that good stuff, you know, but end of the day, there is nothing more important than life. There is nothing more important than that human connection. And there is nothing more important than that movement. Um, and, I, and I saw it somewhere, it's not my line, I wish it was my line, that you know, it was you know, from passion to compassion. Uh -huh. And it really struck, struck home with me from passion to compassion that you know, I think you're really in that, you know, that's what I think COVID has taught at least taught me that you know the it's just a reinforcement of the fundamental human values and of just you know being in the moment and being there for each other. Yeah. So uh, many things I can talk about, but let me stop there. Too. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a beautiful line from passion to compassion. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of that that's taken place. Um, let me do a quick check and the questions come in. Excellent. Okay. So we'll move to question two, the, the big question, uh, the question on most people's minds and why they've joined us. What are your thoughts on a, what a post-COVID-19 world will look like? Very much um, 
unfolding, uh, it's very much unfolding. As I said in my opening comments, I don't think you know, we are anywhere close to post-COVID. Um, I, I think it's, it's a new normal. Um, it's a, um, you know, you mentioned VUCA in your opening comments that I, I think it's very, you know, that's how I see it. It's, it's a lot more of a, you know, VUCA is volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. You know, this is, you know, this, this COVID world or whenever we get to post-COVID, if at all we can, it is very much a, is a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Um, you know, it's, there are a lot of things that we don't know. And, and you know, anybody who claims that, you know, he or she has a very complete uh, picture of the future, uh, I, I would like to, you know, understand that you know, because they just, there are too many variables, there are too many uncertainties, yeah. But in that itself, you know, there are, there is a lesson. Uh, I use this phrase, you know, being in the moment. Um, I. I think you know that is certainly something you know, which is going to be there. You know, being in the moment. You know, being in the moment, both at an individual level, but also for business, also for corporates. So you can't really plan too, too, too much. Yeah, it is a lot more about execution now. You know, how do you execute now? How do you make things happen now? Because the future is so uncertain. So the only reality is. Now is the present moment, yeah. And what is it that you do in that, yeah? And and that has a lot of implications. That has implications on on business models. That has implications on on priorities, uh, on things you focus on. Generally, you know, that's something which I've been talking about for a while. That if you look at strategy to execution, I think there is execution. Is the king in the VUCA world, and 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 I think this whole that's what COVID has also shown us that you know to be in the moment you have to execute now, you have to execute now. Yeah. Uh, if I um, take it to technology, you know, which is space that I know know reasonably well and I can talk about, there's certainly uh, digital. You know, digital transformation, you know, which is you know one of the big mega trends of our generation. You can't say that digital transformation is you know you know is happening because of COVID. Digital transformation, or the world going digital, business going digital, and the rise of digital technologies is, is certainly something which was very much uh, in play. But with COVID, you know, that's come into very sharp focus, very sharp focus, and you know we have seen the evidence over the past months that the digital penetration or the you know has jumped very significantly you know we have the digital penetration increase over the last one year is uh, more than what i think most companies were uh, were planning for over the next three to five years yeah so so that is certainly uh, you know uh, i think with covid that's certainly something we can say there aren't too many things we can say with certainty but this is certainly something we can say uh, that uh, you know digital is now mainstream. There is no question mark, and a lot of the digital technologies like cloud and AI, uh, you know, they have um, you know they have just gone to a completely different level. So that's kind of point number one I would make. I, point number two I would make is, is just around uh, um, you know operating models, working models. You know there is. You know, we have seen this huge shift, you know, to remote working. Uh, do I see a world, you know, which is, you know, which is, which remains 100% remote? No, not, you know, you, you can't generalize that. You can't generalize that. You know, for many situations, you know, the in-person interaction is quite important. You know, if you're bringing a lot of new people into the organization, how do you assimilate them? How do you really build culture, transmit culture, I, I think that in-person interaction is still quite important, but without doubt, without doubt, there are so many learnings of last year you know, that you know, we were able to, most businesses were able to run their business remotely, serve clients, develop new clients, engage employees, bring on new new employees. And over last year, you know, at Encito, we would have, we had well over a thousand new employees. So we were able to do that. 
So there are tremendous learnings from last year. And I don't think that world is going to go back to offices as they were. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there may be a spectrum. I think there's some which are considering almost complete remote working models. Uh, but there are shades of gray given the context of the business. But without doubt, you know, the same office going nine to six kind of routine is not that is changing. Yeah. yeah. And so that's point number two. And point number three I would make is uh, I think organizations and generally the approach will need to become a lot more human centric. Um, and just, you know, I, I think COVID has brought in sharp focus the ephemeral nature of life um, and what a complex world we are in. And therefore that whole value for human life is yeah, I, I think there is going to be a lot more realization of that and employees are going to look for that. You know, I think health and safety is going to become a much bigger issue. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, yeah, just that how organizations become really human centric is going to be even a lot more critical. Let me, let me stop it. That, that's, that's very interesting. I know um, from my brief uh, keyhole view here from uh, Silicon Valley, it's definitely in the direction that you, you're talking about in terms of uh, quality of life and uh, focus on um, you know, sort of pursuing that quality of life. So definitely the case. Well, um, I'm going to interject. We, 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 have, uh, we have a question from Mohit and he, his question is, and it's very specific, it's, it's a sort of a vertical specific question, but he uh, would like to know what are the top three things that you would suggest to software professionals while we're in the middle of COVID that will help us survive, um, you know, personally and professionally in the, and, and how to be ready. And I think this is a general question for everybody, sort of like how to be ready for the, the post COVID world. So yeah, great, great question, Mohit. And uh, see, the world is going through tremendous, tremendous change and, and the pace of change uh, and uncertainty um, is not going to slow down, Mohit. It is, um, it's only going to increase. I think that's the fundamental nature of the world we are in. Now, when things are changing so rapidly and then you ask yourself the question that, okay, how do, how do I prepare myself to to compete in this world, I think a good question to ask Mohit is that, okay, what are some things that don't change? Mm. What are some things that don't change? Yeah. So I think of it at different levels, you know, that, okay, there is a lot of change happening. What is it that is not changing? Yeah. As, as a software professional, and I would extend it to any professional, there are a set of skills, there are a set of competencies which are which are enduring yeah which are enduring the first of that to me is learnability yeah now you can so we are in a world where you as a software professional you need to adapt and change skills very rapidly what are the skills you may have today you can't sit on it you know that skill is going to to there is going to be a peak of it and then it is going to be less relevant whatever skill it is, yeah, whether it is AI, cloud, blockchain, whatever cutting edge, you know, competence you may be at, but will decline. Now, the, what is really important is, is building that, that skill of deliberate learning, learnability, deliberate learning, that how do you very quickly master any new skill? So that's number one. Number two is problem solving core problem solving, the ability to look at any situation and be able to drill down to what is the core problem? What is the bottleneck? What is the real pain point that, that has to be solved? You know, sift through this noise and, and get to the signal. Okay, this is the core thing. And, and problem solving is, is, to my mind, very, very, is a very essential skill. Now, I think for software professionals, often there is such a big focus on the technical skills that, that somewhere the core uh, problem-solving skills do not get enough focus. They are, they are there because, you know, you know, 
as a software professional, you, you need it, but that's not what you are actively focusing on. And, and, and I think that needs to change. You know, for me, it's something I've always wondered that, you know, why there isn't you know, more of a focus on that. Yeah. Third is this whole, what, what I talked earlier also about the whole, the whole human aspect of this, and I would say empathy, the ability to connect uh, with, uh, with the other person at a human level, see others' perspective, see others' perspective, not be in your own head, yeah, but see the others' perspective. And in a, world, in, in a virtual world, where physical interaction may be less than before, this empathy and be able to read the other person is, is so important, is so important, yeah. And the final thing I would say is this ability to think out of the box, yeah, the ability to think out of the box. Because again, this is the world of constant change. The world of technology in particular is constantly evolving. Um, and the only way you can truly win, and which is also, uh, Pimen mentioned the new rules of business that I talked about in my book. And the first rule of business really is innovate and shape the future. The only way you will win is if you're shaping the future. And how do you shape the future? But through innovation. Yeah, and that is out of the box thinking. So I'll stop here, but that's my big message, Moe, that in a world which is changing so rapidly, focus on things uh, which are not going to change. Yeah, and that is learnability, that is problem solving, empathy, and out of the box thinking. As you were as you were speaking and talking about empathy and listening, I was completely distracted by all the, the many questions that we're getting here. So um, I'm, I'm trying to emulate what exactly you're saying right now. We so another question has come in. It's uh, pretty interesting here. So uh, Nitin, how to look at new opportunities? There are apprehensions professionals have in moving from one organization to another during COVID, as people prefer. Uh, to stay in their comfort zone, their organization? Um, do they take a risk? What advice do you have for such professionals? So it's sort of the other end of the spectrum. It's like, uh, you know, how do you do takes hunkering down, staying safe? You know, uh, what advice do you have? Yeah, see, generally my, my view on, um, on careers is that I'm a big fan of the long term. Yeah, and, and it's maybe it may seem like a bit of a paradox, you know, given that I talked uh, quite a bit about being in the present moment. Yeah, um, and, I, and I think you know both of those things are there, you know, being in the present moment, but also uh, taking a long term view, and, and that is also one of the very interesting aspects of this VUCA world, the digital age we are in. You know, where there are constant set of paradoxes. You know, which are playing playing out, and and you know you have to you have to get your head around it. You know, you have to master that duality, that being in the moment, but also being long term. Uh, and this connects back to the question that you asked about career choices. See, generally, my view is stay the course. Okay, stay the course. Yes. Okay. That that you know any any kind of uh, I, I'm not a big fan of you know trying to constantly. Um, you know, move from one opportunity to another. Yeah, because you know, any organization, you know, there is, unless you stay for a while, you don't fully learn and you don't fully contribute. Yeah, you're, you may, you may be able to change jobs and make, get some compensation increase, but you really, you really, really learn through the impact you have. Yeah, you really learn through the impact you have. And you cannot have impact in a very short period of time. It takes at least a couple of years to my mind. It, to my mind, it's at least three to five years. Anything you set out to, to do, it takes at least three to five years to really have impact, yeah? So, and it is through that process. You have to go, it's a process. You have to go through that process and that's, that's how you learn, yeah? So that's, that's the point number one I would make that, um, there is a great value in staying the course and seeing it through. Yeah. Now, having said that, you know, as you as you consider opportunities, I I think more than ever before there is 
there is a there is a need to look at the organization holistically and that you know what are the values of the organization what are the values of the organization now at often for software professionals they are very driven by the program that i will be joining and that is important yeah but there is a very short term thing about this is the program this is the work i will do and this is the technical skills i will learn and it is important it is important but it is important also to take a longer term view and for that understanding the values of the organization and and assessing for for yourself is there a fit between my values what is important for me and what the organization seems to be saying i think is something you should really focus on excellent uh, some more questions have come in um but let me let, let me move to something um that that we that we that we talked about earlier that we were getting into and 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 by the way for everyone that is wondering here's the moment you've been waiting for here is my copy of the book um please if you're interested go to winning in the digital age at .com and you can find out more information in the first chapter I'm, I'll do the plug Nitin and the first chapter is there available for free um everything that Nitin's talking about or most of it uh it's captured in this book sort of a, a lifetime of learning in a in in one book so um sorry Nitin. I'm very pleased to see that your your copy your your version is well well bookmarked so uh yeah, so, so you're done some reading well done thank you thank you well so the VUCA, the VUCA model. We, 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 uh, met, I mentioned it earlier about how to how the new rules of business apply. And uh, so the question is, in the book uh, and in many interviews, you reference the VUCA model. Um, you know, what it, is it specifically for those that don't know anything about it? And th what did the pandemic prove? Did it prove it wrong? Did it embrace it more what, what was what's your view on that yeah so see, VUCA stands for volatile uncertain complex ambiguous yeah volatile is that's moving up and down uh, and very difficult to it's constantly changing yeah and the pattern is not very clear uncertain that you don't know the outcome yeah you don't know the outcome complex is that cause effect relationships are very uh, difficult to establish it's not 2 plus 3 equal to 5 you know it's a very complex multi dimensional probabilistic type of uh, equation if it is an equation at all it's, and ambiguous it's you know reality is hazy it's difficult to see the reality very clearly it's like a mirror on which there is a suit of dust yeah mm. so this is vuka yeah and and you know for for a long time i've been trying to you know i've had the great for, fortune of being engaged on this whole digital age for the past many years my career has coincided in a, in a sense with the growth of the digital age um and i've always you know been struck by you know this is a different beast and how do you really get your head around it yeah and uh, and then i when i left fidelity and joined flipkart you know the india's largest e-commerce company i think that's where the concept of vuka really struck me that hey you know the best way of understanding the digital age is vuka you know it's it's volatile it's uncertain it's complex it's ambiguous it's very different it's very different it's you know and once i think once you understand the the concept of vuka volatile uncertain complex and because once you start internalizing those those words and what they mean i think the digital age and the world we are going through uh becomes very very clear very clear yeah uh covid uh has been a you know is like vuka to the power of vuka okay <laughs> you know you know it's completely volatile you know it's very difficult you know, it just keeps on changing it's very uncertain very uncertain you know in, in india you know we you know, in march we thought that oh everything is you know we are done and you know let's open the offices and blah 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 
Um, and uh, in a couple of weeks, it was a second wave, complete disaster. Uh, yeah, very uncertain. Crazy. You know, complex. Still, there is, you know, it's amazing that, you know, it's been, the world has been 18 months into this pandemic, global pandemic, certainly the biggest event of our generation or across generations, and still there isn't a very clear understanding of how it happened, how it progressed, you know, where it is going. You know, those cause effect relationships are, have been so difficult to establish in, 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 given the, the progress science has made, given the attention, everybody in the world is impacted by that. Yeah, it's still there is no clarity and ambiguous, you know, what is exactly the situation? What it is exactly the situation is not very clear. So this is as VUCA as you can get. Yeah, VUCA on, on steroids. Uh, um, well, let me, uh, let me move to, thank you. Let me move to some other questions. Um, Nitin, what, uh, do you think there would be a continued trend on work from anywhere as this does significant uh, have, this does have significant savings for most uh, organizations. That's from Hardy. Yeah, see, look, you know, it's, uh, given where we were, there's definitely, we are, we are definitely, there is a lot to be said about, um, you know, about this notion of work from anywhere. You know, see, last year has taught us that, so, and it will be completely foolish of us, a remiss of us to, to not take that lesson. You know, work from anywhere has been, you know, has been possible. You know, the productivity that we have seen, the client satisfaction that we have seen has been high. In many cases, it has been higher than earlier. Yeah. And, and also from an employee perspective, it certainly has given more flexibility. I look at my whole life, you know, that over the last 18 months, I've been able to, you know, to jog, to do workouts, to walk, you know, all of these are things that I could have never done earlier given I was traveling three to four days a week. So, so I, you know, I, I think that's true for many, many people that you know, it just gives you a lot more flexibility so why would you not do more of that? Yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, you know, while, see, this is what we are seeing today. Yeah. But yeah. we have to, you know, we have, there are, but there are some things, you know, which where the in-person interaction is important. You know, I, I run a young and growing company. Yeah. A company which is growing at 30, 40% every year, which means that, you know, we bring lots of people every year and, where we are also still forming the culture of the company. How do you how do you how do you really build and propagate that culture? Because you know it's not a formal training program. Culture is something in which you absorb through observation. Through observation, culture is what happens when nobody is looking. It happens through these random events, random accidents, you know, water cooler conversations. And that's how you build strength. You know, that's how you build longevity. So, so there is, um, and, and learning, you know, we talked about learning each other. You know, learning is not just individual. Learning is not just going to Coursera or somewhere. Else. Learning is from each other. Role modeling, mentorship. Um, for role modeling and mentorship to happen, you know, you need to first have a relationship. Um, so so there, are, there are a number of aspects which, I think do require that in-person interaction. And I think the world to, to my mind is very much about a hybrid model. Yeah. Now in hybrid, there is, a, there is going to be a wide range of options and depending on the context of the business, different options may make sense for different, different organizations. But I think very much it's, it's, it's a hybrid model. I, I don't see a, you know, back to exactly where we were uh, 18 months back. Uh, but but for most businesses that I know or know well, I think a, a complete hundred percent work from anywhere model also uh, to me um, will leave uh, some significant gaps. Uh, Nitin, I'm uh, I'm aware of the time and the audience as well. We're we're, we're 
past the, the bottom of the hour, but um, if, if you have time, we'll continue. There's a lot more questions that come in. Um, yes, yes, let's see. I'd love to take questions there. Okay, excellent. So let's see. Automation, machine learning, uh, maximizing, maximizing use of digital with minimal human intelligence. Would, uh, would see most momentum post COVID, are we going to see less humans? As digital space grows, we'll focus on security also increase. What is your intake on these? Uh, that's from Uma Kant. Yeah, look, you know, certainly uh, Uma Kant was certainly, um, you know, over the last 18 months, you know, with digital kind of becoming just increasing in, in relevance and scale, um, you know, AI machine learning has also um, just, you know, also been increasing very significantly over the last, I think it's something which has started even, started even before COVID that AI machine learning had started to move from what I call POCs, you know, proof of concept to POS, proof of scale. So that was something which was already beginning to happen, but has certainly picked up um, speed. But I would not say, Umakan, that it is replacing human intelligence. Yeah, I, I think it's a, to me, it's very misleading and, and it, it kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of, it is not really, you know, kind of understanding the situation fully. It is certainly replacing human effort uh, in, you know, in many cases, and that's really what technology has been doing, um, you know, since wheel was invented, you know, whatever, you know, uh, many, many, uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of years back, you know, with, 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 with the rise of technology, it is replacing human effort and, you know, in a, and to channelize in a more efficient and effective manner, which is also what AI is doing, yeah. But I don't think it takes away human intelligence I think what it certainly means is that it raises the bar for how we as professionals, you know, where we can add value. It raises the bar for that, yeah. So let me give you a concrete example. Now, with the rise of AI and machine learning, well, what was the traditional space for, let's say, analytics is perhaps shrinking because you, know, you have a lot of self-learning models. You're not always tuning them and validating them. And then, you know, there are a lot of pre-built models, but all of this is now really kind of getting, really having a deep impact on what is the business layer. Yeah. And, you know, what traditionally has been seen as a consulting layer. Yeah. So, there is a lot more to be done in terms of, okay, I now have a lot more data. It is a lot more available on a real-time basis. I can drive not just insights, but actions from that. Now, what does it mean for my business? What does it mean for my customers in terms of what services I can offer to them, how I can, how I can solve their pain points, and eventually in terms of the business model. There is a lot more to be done there. Yeah. So something may shrink, but something else is is definitely opening up and that has been the nature of the technology and human interaction for, for the last thousands of years. And I don't see that changing. Now, it is also a question of who moved my cheese, you know, that if you if one gets stuck in that, that, oh, this is what I was doing, this was my skill and, oh, this is getting shrunk uh, because of AI or other technology, yeah, then it is getting shrunk, yeah. but. If you know one is adaptive, and which is really the first point I made in this conversation, that's what COVID talk taught me that you have to be constantly adaptive. Yeah, if you're adaptive, if you have this opportunity mindset, then I think there are, I, I see there is very little risk of human extension because of AI. I, I very much see them as uh, mutually complementary and reinforcing uh, kind of trends. Okay, excellent. Uh, let me move to a, a different type of question. Uh, what would happen to large office spaces, hotel and hospital, uh, hospitality industry, or hospitality industries, et cetera? What do you think should be done to utilize large infrastructure that is now vacant? This is uh, definitely a, out of a different area. It's <laughs> an interesting question. It's an interesting question. And 
Yeah, you know, it is uh, on, a, on a lighter note. I, I really saw that in you know the town where I live in Short Hills in New Jersey. You know, we have this big mall, huge mall, oh, yeah. our house, and it has this big Sears outlet, you know, huge, you know, which is, yes. of course, given what's happened in the retail industry is completely empty. It's like a, it's like a ghost town and it was converted and it still is into a COVID vaccination center. Uh, and I said, wow, what a great use that is of an empty space. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, you know that, that is one example, but doesn't answer the full thing. Um, I don't know. I think it's something to be thought about. You know, I think I think there's a lot to be thought about in terms of uh, real estate and real estate strategy, ownership models. You know, perhaps, you know, there is, you know, there is, perhaps this is really a big impetus from, um, you know, to shared ownership models, you know, to more pay as you go usage models, uh, and which I think is, is a general trend, you know, which is again, that's one of the aspects of digital from, you know, where, you know, where you know, uh, digital has really proliferated shared ownership models. And, and I think with COVID and real estate in particular, I think that's something, this fractional ownership um, and pay as you go, almost a SaaS type of models, I think will get, um, you know, there's a lot to think about there. Uh, yeah. The <laughs> I was just thinking of all the commercial real estate salespeople that are were hanging on your the answer there. Um, another question: How would the new normal bring down international travel needed to collaborate for business, or especially when doing technology consulting? Do you think using tools like Zoom, Teams, Microsoft Teams would bridge the gap and not bring down the speed and impact? We already know the answer, isn't it? That you know, the last 18 months, you know, travel and international travel has come down dramatically, dramatically. You know, if you know many companies are showing better uh, profitability, you know, one of the big factors in that is lower travel costs. Yeah, and and that has been substituted with Zoom, Teams, other methods, and I think they have been incredibly effective in some cases the you know the collaboration is a lot more real time you don't have to wait for like a big in person meeting it kind of it's kind of more in steps it's more intermittent you know it's more ongoing uh, you can try different models and I'll, I'll give an example so every year you know for many many years and i've always i end the year last two weeks of december i have always done like a strategy offset yeah, okay. and typically the strategy offsite, you know, has fifteen people, you know, maximum twenty people. Now this year we couldn't get people together for the strategy offsite, so we said, okay, we'll do it over Zoom. Yeah. So then we said, okay, we will do it over Zoom. So then you know what stops us from, you know, why only twenty people? You know, embed the entire company. Yes. Yeah? So we had, uh, you know, we had like multiple sessions. I think it was over couple of days, you know, four days or so, and we had maybe eight, nine sessions. And we have we sent the invite to over 2000 uh, colleagues that we have in our company. And that was amazing. You know, now at, you know, we created it as a conference, you know, where maybe, you know, 40, 50 were interacting live, but all 2000 plus could, you know, could join in and listen in and, and kind of send their questions, which is a very different, I don't know, amazing, it was amazing innovation. And I thought it was super effective. No, we would have never done that if it was not for COVID and not for the virtual world we are in. So there is a lot, you know, I, see, that's the point we have been making that the world has changed. Okay, so there are new methods of working and you have to adapt, yeah. But again, is it that there is no need for international travel? I have answered, of course, no, there is a need for international travel. And But I would expect it to certainly come down significantly, at least for business purposes. Okay. Well, and, and I, uh, I want to be cognizant of the time. Uh, let, let's let's jump to one last topic as we sort of. I think there's a question from Vivek Kakre, which I think is quite oh, yeah. interesting. Please, please. And yeah. I, I see the question here on Zoom that 
Uh, I think work from uh, home may have advantages, but the key is how to keep yourself motivated over a long, longer period of strict work from home. What are your suggestions to keep motivation levels high? Uh, if it's okay, uh, Tim, yeah. I would like to share some thoughts on that. Uh, yeah. I think it's, it's a very, very, um, very important question uh, because the last 12 18 months being at home, yeah, there is there is more flexibility that came in our lives, you know, but at the same time, there's also fatigue, a lot of fatigue, and there's a lot of uh, uh, just you know the same old, same thing, same thing, you know, because you know, when you're going to office, you had you had a certain break in your schedule. And then you were interacting with others and you just you know, wake up, you log onto your laptop and there you go. <laughs> so uh, mental health, uh, mental fatigue is certainly, a, I think, a very, very important issue. I think it is getting discussed now, but I think not enough, not enough. Okay. And for not just now, but at least for the last six, eight months, that has been my view that this is probably the biggest challenge of COVID. Yeah, it's because it's not, it creeps upon you. It creeps yeah. upon you. Uh, it's not that suddenly you say, oh, I, I am, you know, I have a mental health issue. No, it just slowly keeps on building up. And, and it's, uh, I can just share with you, uh, Vivek, that you know, some of the things that, uh, that I've been doing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very important to have some strict boundaries in your schedule. Yeah, so I do block out my time, you know, which is, you know, where I don't schedule uh, meetings. Well, this is absolutely critical. Um, and I have used that time, um, you know, initially for a lot of walking in the nature. I'm quite blessed to stay in a town which is very green, very beautiful. And, and I just, you know, long walks in the nature. And, and I just find uh, being close to nature, being very therapeutic, yeah. Um, and then, you know, this time with family, you know, the, the good thing about COVID was that my kids, you know, were in college, you know, were home. And given my travel, given they were all in different places, you know, we hadn't really spent time as a family for years, really. Um, and, and, you know, last year was a great opportunity to, um, to be really together as a family. And I, I, I found that to be very, very uh, nourishing. Um, and, and then, you know, I also took that opportunity of, of learning, you know, I enrolled for a couple of courses, you know, my passion is around spirituality, and I, and I ended up, you know, doing a couple of courses there, which were tremendous, you know, so different things, you know, you have to, uh, you know, you have to go outside of work, yeah, you, you, it is critical, you know, work can consume you and Zoom can eat you up, yeah, so you have to very consciously with a lot of discipline, draw some boundaries uh, and then use that time, whether it's sports, whether it's learning, whether it's family. I, I think having those partitions is absolutely critical. At least for me, um, I think I think worked. You know, I was able to, you know, I feel fitter. I think physically, I, I definitely fitter. I, I think I lost maybe you know, eight kgs or something, or maybe even more. Uh, I feel fitter than ever before. I took the time to write this book. I could have never written the book if it was not for the COVID. You know, I created that time and, I, and that's something which is very energizing for me. I feel it's okay. It's something that I've been able to contribute. So um, create the time, partition time, and then then kind of with a lot of discipline, put it on, on, on something else, you know, which are your areas of passion. But and it's into your to the points you raised. I mean, it, we talked. To, it was in the the cycle of positivity. I could say personally for me, it's uh, from from the book and from interacting with you and talking about it, like creating that cycle of positivity early on. You, I mean, you brought that up with me, and that's been part of my sort of toolkit to manage the way through this. Like you said, Zoom will eat you up. It doesn't care. It, it, it will take as much time as, as uh, you have. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I can say, I can say that um, that's one tool uh, I picked up, the cycle of positivity. So um, I know we have lots uh, more questions that we aren't going to be able to get to. 
and uh, we're we're getting towards the the, the, the top of the hour here. So um, I, I guess we should probably move towards closing, Nathan. And um, is there is there any last uh, words you'd like to share with everybody? Obviously, this we're, we're going to move towards making this a a weekly event. We really appreciate people joining us, but um, any closing thoughts, Nathan? Yeah, you know, see this whole COVID, I, I think is just uh, been, an, you know, it's a very, very significant event um, in our lives and we're still going through that. See, the way I look at it uh, and what I want to share with you really is that, look, it's, it, it has taught me a lot about life. I, I, I think for everybody that some of the fundamentals of life. It's a, it's, a, it's a great reminder of that, that life is ever-changing. Life is, you know, temporary. Life is ever-changing, yeah? And what it means is that you have to be in the moment, yeah? You have to constantly change and adapt with the way life and the world around us is changing, yeah? And, and then... Ultimately, the value of, of just that human connection, that is the most important thing in life and also in business. It's not different, okay? Also in business. So whatever are these fundamental lessons of life that, hey, it's constantly changing. Yeah, it's very uncertain, the VUCA thing. Yeah, this changing, it's us uncertain. That is very true for business. That is true for technology. So be in the moment. Yeah, that focus on what you have in front of you, focus on that execution. Yeah, uh, but keep on adapting, keep on changing, whether it is from you know, to remote working or to a hybrid model uh, or from physical presence to digital, from to new technologies, keep on adapting, uh, but never forget the human connection. Well, Nitin, thank you so much for the time. I'm glad you and I were able to connect and. And obviously we connected with a, a lot of people out in the audience. We thank you for your submission, uh, question submissions. We'll, we'll add them to um, the future conversations that, that we have here with Ask Nitin. And uh, thank you so much again for joining us at, uh, for this first session of Encito Live, Ask Nitin. And uh, please be sure to put your comments in um, LinkedIn and uh, other social media. Again, we really appreciate it and please follow us. and. Look forward to more conversations, and if you uh, if you really, I'll I'll plug it one more time. If you if you really want to dive deep, uh, take a look at winningindedigitalage.com or go on to Amazon and uh, get your own copy. So, Nitin, thank you again for the time. We really thanks, Tim. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye for now.